start with today's motif, Fugazi. Like the term snafu, situation normal, all flarked up. Or fubar, flugged up beyond all recognition. The lesser known Fugazi stems from the same basic family of meaning, but no acronym. During the Vinet Ram military incursion, Fugazi came to mean a flarked up situation with no easy way out. Or, as a verb, it meant to flug up a scenario or person, or to get or become flarked up, often by surprise, due to various mitigating factors, mostly outside one's control. Here's an example. The cyber platoon had barely stumbled into an abandoned coastal village where a four-year-old girl knelt sobbing beside a bloodied teddy bear. That's when Ensign Harding heard the ting of a tripwire abrading the laces on his left grip boot. It's a fugazi, he thought. The girl scurried into the jungle moments before the explosion. The war fugazied many a soldier's mind and body beyond recognition in such encounters with the enemy on both sides. And don't get me started on the civilians caught in the crossfire. It was all one big fugazi. If you're like me, that example might leave you feeling conflicted. Did the platoon wander into a fugazi? Or did their entire military operation fugazi a nation of innocent people minding their own business, such as the disorienting nature of a true fugazi? However, you may have heard a variant of the term in or around Neo Jersey, pronounced fugazi or fugazi. This slang comes from the branched off definition, which signals fake. An imposter, forgery, or knockoff is also flarked up but in a more narrow sense. Hello, Mr. Bevins? Ah, don't, J just don't. You startled Am me. Am I interrupting? No, I, I mean, yes, but no. Who is this? Protect me. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting, sir. How may I help you? Look, I don't know where to begin. I I've been stuck in this lobby area for many days, weeks. Where am I? What the hell's going on here? Okay, one thing at a time. Could you speak up, Percy? Or whatever you're... Can you hear me? What? You there? You Dan? No, I, I was going to talk about the downside up. Good. Don't wait for him. Might as well throw your afterlife in a dumpster. They're way overextended. And if you let it get to you, next thing you know, you're moping around like a rubber-nosed woodpecker in a petrified forest. Thanks, Blumpy. When we left off, dream hackers, we had put a cyber pin in the tail of Zandra in the salt marsh wearing her psi mask. She had a run in with the unknown sheriff who perished trying to arrest her. Then the first backup officer, Mark Markson, arrived with a talking bee on his arm and he froze in a panic as a giant carnivorous jellyfish emerged out of the water. And who could forget Mark's tense encounter with Detective Loey Dross, on whom he had a crippling crush. Loey's velvety tenor shook him. Lower your weapon, Mark, said Loey. Don't listen to him, buddy. He ain't seen what we've seen. Mark prayed no one else noticed the talking bee. He also became aware that he had primed his tactical laser pistol and was aiming it at wherever he looked. The red dot of a laser sight flitted about on the two detectives, Loey and Evelyn. Is that my sight? He wondered in a daze. Loey intensified his command. Officer Markson, your drawn weapon threatens responding force members. We will take active measures to disarm you if you don't comply in three, two. Okay, my slip up. Mark obeyed Loey, holstering his tactical laser pistol. His pulse thumped through his veins and he felt flush. B rolled his eyes in disgust. Well, someone's a pork pie short of a picnic. Loey softly barked orders. We're going to lure it back to the silt. 
then put the boot on its neck, so to speak. I'm going left, Evelyn right. You back. Back up. Everyone low. Told ya. The giant jellyfish snaked forward and screed like a banshee. Catching all of them off guard, it dropped Xandra in the shallows. Loey lunged to catch her like a damned valiant fool, and he cushioned her fall quite well before falling himself into the salty brine and onto the nemesis stingers of a tenth tentacle. It stung him ruthlessly. Another tentacle swung around to grab him by the waist. Mark abandoned his post to intercept Loey. The tentacles aligned against him. Mark felt the firm grip of the tentacle bound for Loey's waist. It slammed into Mark's back like a giant suction cup. He embraced Loey, nonetheless, thinking it might throw the creature off balance. I see what you're doing, and it ain't kosher, pal. Mark, exclaimed Loey. The two men came face to face. Loey's panicked breath blew upon the whiskers of Mark's mustache. Loey's piercing green eyes widened. His mouth closed. Mark decided to do the unthinkable. He kissed Loey. Another tentacle swallowed his right leg, or so he assumed as it went numb from the thigh down. Well, ain't that special. Cost you a leg, but hey, maybe it's worth it. Carpe diem and all that hooey. Shut up. What? Loey reared back. By now, the searing blasts of Evelyn's tactical laser rifle were ricocheting around them, singeing the monster's skin. Is this it? You could have told me. Evelyn and I have. Shut up and kiss me, Mark said. And he did. One time. Before the giant hydroid pulled Loey under and vanished in a sluice of dark waters. Mark collected himself in the shallows, losing his balance as one leg was lost. Evelyn approached. She trembled before him. Her fear became anger. What did you just do? She asked. Look at me, Mark. Xandra slowly rose to her feet. Who do you people think you are? She said. Have you no shame? Prancing about like teenagers in a game of laser tag? I almost died. Endangered pollinators were sighted. An unknown species of hydroid just dragged your own colleague into the river. Where's the biome preservation response? The dive team, you disgust me. And with that, she dove in after Loey. Usually I'd say her elevator doesn't stop at every floor. But that naked gal chasing a giant man-eating jellyfish is right. Y'all look like whatever the cat dragged in and the kittens didn't want. Well, these folks were in a fugazi indeed. We'll have to return to the salt marsh down the line to see if they can unfugazi themselves. Till then, we need to talk about the last night. I was a fly on the wall in a watering hole digi dive bar in Brooklyn's. Zelly, a she assassin you may recognize from our first glitch in the Matrix, sat at the bar. She poked at the cubes in her sidecar with a straw. Beside her perched a crusty old fence near the end of his life. He held a ring to his holophone light and squinted through it with a cyber monocle. Fugazi, he said. But I can get you five for it. Five? You schwitzing me, Odell? Said the assassin. His dead-eyed pout indicated he was not. Or... I could not stick my soiled neck out for you, Zelly, but on account of it being your last day, five. Fine, she said, sipping the drink. She drank like a free solo climber holds onto a cliff face for dear life. It was the one crack in her otherwise icy smooth exterior, that gesture. She went on. Thing is, I'm already hashing out something to set me up for the next phase. Speak English or stuff it, said the old man. I'm going to liberate the baby. Don't take a baby, honey. You don't get to tell me what to do. And with that, she scooched out her bar stool awkwardly. She tapped her timepiece to confirm Odell had transferred the 5,000 creds. 
and he barely caught up to her on her way out the back door. It was a cold, wet night, so not an ideal time to give chase on his single-speed bike, considering she had mounted a boosted hoverboard and jetted off down a side street, but ride he did. They parked near a brownstone with a grand, curving bay window behind which a woman stood burping an infant and wiping spittle from its chin on the third floor. It's not hers, said Zelly. Is that really your business? Child belongs to an indigenous tribe that's being actively hunted and eradicated in the boundary zone. Big whoop, that's no place for a newborn. Which is why I'm on this mission. I work for myself now and for the cause of liberation. Odell cursed under his breath and whispered hoarsely as he trailed her. Wait, how was that retirement? As they sidled up to the building, she unholstered a grappling gun. It fired at a bas-relief pineapple on the roof cornice, locked and zipped her up to the third story. Just stand guard as promised, okay, geezer? He flattened against the side of the house and flipped down an infrared visor with a huff. Percy, just checking in. Blompy? I don't know if she gets the baby. It seems like one of those harebrained schemes that always ends up in a total fugazi. But we shall see it through. Speaking of which, I was passing the time reading this Fugazi May 92 issue of Red Book, and I found a dog-eared pamphlet buried in its pages that appears to be addressed to me. It says that although the techno afterlife has arrived, the fact that I'm here means I have not. Obvi. It goes on to say, We regret to inform you the meta-metaverse is at carrying capacity. Unless a member, blah blah, gets disintegrated, okay, there's no room for old Thornton, fine. No cyber skin off my back? You think I want to enter your virtual heaven? The place full of douche nozzles who worked for my former megacorp employers and got digital afterlife insurance like me? You mean the same schmucks who, consequently, betrayed me in life? Please do not force me to spend eternity there. It's rude. Going through that door would be my personal hell. So at the very least, can you scratch me off the wait list to be onboarded? You got me trapped here in the Waitrix, or whatever you call this misbegotten way station. What a lousy excuse for limbo. Has anyone ever escaped? That's something I would like to read about. According to the sign-in sheet, Flather Mergelbaum checked in before me, but I haven't seen head or tail of him. Okay, you know what? It's nap time. Before we plummet into the credits, time for another shocking sleep fact. This one paraphrased from Dr. Andrew Huberman. You may be interested to know that two neurotransmitters play an important role in learning something intentionally, like a new language. Epinephrine, aka adrenaline, creates alertness, and acetylcholine marks the neurons most active during this heightened level of alertness. Those are your two neurotransmitters. So what's the make or break aspect of this sort of directed learning or good neuroplasticity? Yes, it involves slumber, but it's more than that. So much more that I'll have to hit you with it after the credits. Screaming Panda presents Fugazi, episode 15 of Hellgate City. Fugazi was written, performed, and produced by Kevin Barry, who also composed the music. The Glitch in the Matrix bonus story for this chapter is called Goldmine. It's available on the show's Patreon at patreon.com forward slash Hellgate City. Or just go to hellgatecity.com. We reject ads and sponsors. Instead, we rely on our supporters to keep this show going. In return, patrons get exclusive weekly glitches, the short but sweet bonus stories capping off each episode and adding a twist on the theme, plus behind-the-scenes content, field notes, pre-release music, field recordings, and more. For transcripts, visit hellgatecity.com. 
Join us on social media at Hellgate City. Till next time, dream hackers. I'll catch you sitting in the waiting room. The make or break aspect of directed learning all depends on being able to apply maximum attention and focus on what you're trying to learn, which actually gets written into your nervous system while you sleep. So, being rested is as important as all the brain chemistry mentioned and the studying and hard work you put in, since without it, nothing sticks. Till we meet again.